Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training has really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely sensational discussion with DC Sports Training's Jeff Moyer. Jeff and I are going to sit down and we're going to talk about vision training and the key movements in sprinting. Guys, as, as always, with all these talks, I really hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please hit that like button, hit that share button. And if you haven't subscribed yet on iTunes, Podomatic, or SoundCloud, please do so. This truly is an awesome talk, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Jeff, thanks so much for coming back on with us today, buddy. Thanks, man. Yeah, long time to see here. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's been a whole, like, 36 hours. Uh, yeah, it's coming right off. Right off of CVASPs, coming off an awesome presentation, uh, absolutely killer talk on, on training vision for sport performance. Uh, for the, the people that are listening that didn't get their butts down there and didn't watch it online, let's give them a little Cliff Notes review of it, you know, that where the idea yeah. came from, what you were talking about, and uh, what were some of the take-home points? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's to me, it's common sense. I don't know. It, it, you know, where the idea came from. It came from Dr. Harrison, but I mean, it's, it's been around further than that. It's just connecting vision and the motor control, motor learning stuff that's being talked about now with perception and action and self-organization and constraints led approach, but it's kind of both ends. It's looking at both ends critically um, and tying them together rather than just one or the other. So there's sports vision training, which Primarily is just vision stuff done in a clinic, done on, uh, on some kind of technology, done with uh, something. And then you have the other on the spectrum is all these movement people. Uh, but neither of them really kind of understand each other. The vision people don't know perception and action and, and how movement is formed in sports and mechanics and stuff like that. And then the perception action people don't fully understand the visual side and the vision demands. So... I was just trying to connect the dots. Yeah, no, and it was it was freaking sensational. And I you know, we've talked about this for a long time how 
you know, the, the difference between change of direction and agility is that ability to, to read the situation and react to it. And I think that this is something that, that people have slept on forever. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, go ahead. Let, let's talk more about that. Like, why is it overlooked? How is it overlooked? And what are some things people could do simply to, to be better at it? Um, just from what I'm hearing from people or when I talk to them about this stuff, uh, either they know about it and they just don't know where to start, uh, or they know about it and they don't believe in it because there's not a lot of studies done on it, uh, or they just try to stay in their lanes. Those are kind of like the three things I get from it, you know, in their lanes being we're strength and nutrition coaches and physical preparation coaches, and that's what we should really care more about. Um, the information is out there, but it's, I, I think, uh, it's more dealing with coaches talking to the coaches that are doing it rather than it's in a study. Um, like I said, in the presentation, it's hard to take these visual skills and put, they're, they're put them in a bottle, um, or they're done on low level athletes, or they're done using one piece of equipment rather than, uh, this program and this scheme. And, um, don't even necessarily know if these people that were studying, uh, uh need these visual skills or the prerequisites that sometimes go into it. Um, you know, you can't have good depth perception if you don't have good binocularity, you know. So if we're doing binocular or depth perception studying, well, we should first make sure they have binocularity. Otherwise, you're not, your, your test is going to come out false. Um, and again, a lot of it's just done in labs, not out on the field, not on the on the court or the, the, the whatever. Um, and that's what Dr. Harrison and Ryan Harrison have been doing, man. They've been doing it for 40 years plus. Uh, they're out on the fields, in the cages, right uh on the pitch with all these guys so um yeah that's that's where that is and then where to start um first of all i really think slow the game down is just ahead of the curve they have been um so i i would advise everyone to go there um and pretty much get everything they have i'm biased um just because i believe in everything they do um I would say get everything there, but then again, you can get a lot of cheap and easy visual tools. So what I try to do in my presentation is one, keep it applicable to team sports, but two, not have a lot of technology because I think sometimes that can scare people in, in, in the technology with sports vision training. It's super expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so unless you fully believe in it, um, well then there's that Avenue, I guess is a lot of people just get these technologies and think that cures all. You know, that's just that's just going to fix it. And that's the magic pill. But it's, it's a great tool, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't solve everything. But I guess when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so, yeah. So I would say start with uh, finding people that are doing it. Bill Harrison and Ryan Harrison are doing it. Um, you know, I'll gladly help anybody who has questions. Uh, I'm an open book and I, I'm willing to help because I have been fortunate to have people such as yourself and Yosef and Dr. Yesis and Dr. Harrison, who just, for whatever reason, uh, take a liking to me and answer my questions when I bombard them. So I would do that. And then, uh, yeah, I would start there. Well, I mean, you're a good looking guy from upstate New York who likes to drink beer. I mean, what is there not to like about you? I mean, come on, <laughs> full package. <laughs> you know, and then there was also another cool thing that came out the other day that, will be available to the general public Friday, and it's your fourth chapter in the third <laughs> manual. Um, and another shameless plug here, uh, volume two, I think, is where you wrote the chapter on vision training. So for people that, that are, are looking at this and are thinking, well, I don't want to spend a lot of money, well, for like 35 bucks, you can get one of those books that's really 10 books in and of itself. But Jeff does a great job breaking down all of that. And when, if you're sitting here thinking, like, what's, binocularity or whatever he just said um if you go to chapter 10 you'll know yeah because it's a really good simple concise breakdown thanks man yeah that's right um a lot of the information i talked about in the presentations right in that chapter and i tried to give a lot of exercises to, to try to explain um what you can do using your finger using a, uh, i think a toilet paper roll using a laser pointer using simple things um, like that, but yeah, that's, that's all in that chapter. So let's talk about your fourth chapter, the one in the manual volume three, uh, the green album, as yeah, we'll call it, like, uh, like the Beatles. There you go. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. So let's break uh, that down a bit. Yeah, man, this one, this one, 
um, not that the sports vision training or anything, this one I feel, man, is one of the most important things as physical preparation coaches we could, I think, understand. Um, and I've been fortunate to talk to Natalia Verkashansky on many occasions, a couple times down at CVAP um, and via Skype and email. She feels the same way. And it's just there's a lack of, um, I don't know, I don't know what it is with it, man, but it's key movements uh, and, bi and biomechanics. Um, and I directed this particular chapter towards sprinting just to give some examples. But what key movements are is every biodynamic bio structure, uh, motor skill, let's say it's running or throwing or cutting or jumping, there are certain certain joint actions are meant for producing force and some are not. Um, and according to uh, Dr. Yuri Verkashansky, where this information came from, he kind of classifies this as two, two movements, two exercises. Um, there's key movements and secondary movements. Um, and he, where he got this information, not a lot of people know that he was a protege of uh, uh, Nikolai Bernstein. Um, I don't think hardly anyone ever knows that. Uh, I can't go anywhere or, or turn on anything in our industry without hearing about Bernstein. Um, but no one talks about that. Um, no one talks about that Zatsiorsky uh, was a protege under Bernstein. And both of these gentlemen um, talk about key movements. Um, and so that's what I try to try to bring out. Um, I, I spoke with Professor Mark Laddish, who's like the foregone expert in, Ladder, in uh, Bernstein, uh, literally has written many books on him um, about this idea of key movements. And he said, yeah, he remembers reading something about it. Bernstein didn't call it key movements, but it was something of, of that nature. Um, yeah, I think it was Yuri, uh, Yuri Verkashansky or Mel Sif that called it key movements. I think Yuri called it motor determinants. But nonetheless, um, he does remember it coming from uh, Bernstein. Right. So everyone keeps using the picture of uh, what Bernstein studied, uh, with the degrees of Freeman movement with the, with the blacksmith hammering the nail. And we're all looking at the different trajectories and bandwidth of the hammer. But no one's talking about the shoulder, wrist uh, or elbow that it's contributing to the force and to the movement, because uh, those would be the key movements. Right. Those are the force producing the actions. And everyone's looking at, OK, there's variability, but, um, you know, how what's good variability what's bad but uh so key movements in sprinting uh we go into detail about it and the study's done on it um just <laughs> i i'm a, I'm a historian so I, I like tracing things back and so i kind of go through the history of studying biomechanics and sprinting um go through just some of it i don't get into detail about a lot of it and how for some reason this is overlooked um this information uh, and Dr. Yassis is really kind of the one that brought it, uh, well, he's the one obviously brought it to my attention, to your attention, uh, and to the forefront uh, in English before uh, Natalia and, and Yuri. Um, and he kind of used his PhD in biomechanics to elaborate upon it. Um, but the study's done. Uh, I've had studies, and I talked to uh, Professor Zatsiorsky about his studies because uh, they were actually done in his lab um, showing this information. And... Uh, you talk to any strength coach, I don't care where they are, you ask for the five top uh, books, you know, for industry in, in science practice of sports training. It's usually right up there by Zatsiorsky. And on page, I think it's 168, he talks about the principle of accentuation, um, which is meant to be a practical um, principle for coaches that we are supposed to st strengthen the muscles and the range of motion um, for exercises that produce force um, for movements. And he has an example of the knee drive, and he talks about it. And then uh, in the Soviet Sports Review, I think the study was done in 1981 in his lab. He goes into great detail about it. And uh, speaking with him, he remembers it um, well. And he said, I was able to share it. So that's what I did in the, uh, present, in the uh, chapter. Yeah. And I think that what's really awesome about the chapter is it, breaks down not only what you're looking at, but why you're looking at it and how you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, what are the force producing actions? And then what are the, what are the joint actions that uh, require the most energy of the body? Right. We talk a lot about energy expenditure, but what are the ones that require the most? 
Um, there's studies, which I didn't add into the chapter. You can find looking at our, you know, the role of fatigue, what fatigues in sprinting or in running, um, you know, and they talk about this and, and what Zatsiorsky found it's, it, and they found in this, um, this particular study was it's the hip joint, uh, hip, hip joint flexion. Right? It talks about hip joint flexors. When when those fatigue, then the pawback's not going to be as good. Then the uh, contact is going to be more uh, out in front of the hips, and then there's going to be uh, less amortization phase and more sinking, um, and that's just going to lead to a chain of kind of uh, shit river, so <laughs> um, so to speak. So he talks about you know the utmost importance of training the hip flexors, and then in the principle of uh, accentuation in his book, he gives. The practical examples for coaches. This is what we should be doing, and train it in any other range of motion would be foolish. Yeah, those, those are his words, and so, um, yeah, I just tried to bring that out. Yeah, and I think that it is funny that it's, you know, one of the books that everyone does talk about is that, but for some reason that whole aspect either has been overlooked or glanced through or misinterpreted or whatever it may be. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why, because uh, that, ex- that very, I mean, diagram, to other extents, it's in Matt Babb's book, it's in um, many of Bert Verkashansky's books. Um, I think Dr. Bonnerchuk might have it in one of his books, um, and on a podcast, I think I did, or I think it was with Jake Jensen, Jake asked him if he was training sprinters, what would be some of the top specialized developmental exercises that he used, and Dr. B said the knee draft. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine that. Pretty uh, cool. Yeah. Um, Which you can find uh, Jay's excellent um, videos on in the community. Yeah. Going through this. I mean, I mean that we got it from Dr. Yesus, you know, and we try to give practicality to it. And so uh, the three key movements in sprinting are the ankle joint extension, the knee drive, and, and the paw back. And lately there's a lot of research, and everyone's talking about the two-mass model and in more force into the ground and or mass specific force and the, in the shorter contact and the, uh, force transmission of the feet and ankles. Well, you know, okay. But if, if the feet and ankles are the main force absorbers, uh, in mortalizers, well, wouldn't it make sense that that energy has got to be given back. Right. And that's, where, that's where the push off comes in. So, uh, they talk about that in the study and yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I do think there's some weight to both, just like there's some weight to, other exercises like like the squat or some other general strength yeah. exercises to associate with this to help assist with these things. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, yeah, totally. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. that, that This this is and, – and, and, again, I just applied to sprinting. Um, I'd love to do – write some more um, about throwing and stuff like this. That's where Dr. Yesis's work is head and shoulders, in my opinion, above anything else that's out there because he does it. He can – do key movements. He knows the key movements for just about every biodynamic uh, action. So, yeah. And then he's got tons of exercises to improve those. Oh, yeah. So I guess, though, what we really should kind of bring it all around with here is, like, why did we just go through about 90% of your chapter? <laughs> yeah, dude. Um, and there's a lot more to it. But, uh, right. yeah, man, because, you know, I, I think – I think, and I'm biased because I'm in it, but I, I would be buying them regardless because I love those type of books. It's a high performance training, and in your books, how you got all it's pretty much 10 books in one, man. Um, and this manual, uh, I saw oh, what who else you got. I mean, you got a lot of great guys, but Rick Bruner and uh, um, a couple of the, your other speakers they've had, uh, Michael Kalinsky, mm-hmm. Dr. Mike, you know, who those, those guys are awesome. Those are guys I'm excited. Um, to listen to or when they came down to your presentation. So, um, yeah, what uh, I think we're going to do, right, is give the chapter out for free for those that sign up. Yeah. Um, just as a taste, uh, hopefully some information that they're interested in and a taste of how great I think your manual is. I, I mean, my chapter is by no way the best chapter in the book, but hopefully coaches can get something out of it and at least uh, – change their perspective of how they look at uh, sprinting and sprint training. Yeah, and I I think there's 10 really unique and different chapters in this one because we're yeah. looking at, you know, we're starting with Randy Ballard, 
talking yeah. about you know our roles and all of those things. And then we've got Bob Alejo, uh, Brett, yep. Aaron and Mike Curtis, uh, your chapter, Drew talking about how absolutely dog shit of an intern <laughs> director I was. Yeah, um, that, that's a great chapter. <laughs> yeah, because that was all my fault. Um, thanks, Drew, for picking me up. Um, Dr. Mann, Bruner, Kalinsky, and Jimmy Snyder breaking down that whole isometric yeah. model that he uses with his guys and his, his women up there in, in Wisconsin. It's, it really is. It's, it's loaded, man. I mean, yeah. that, that's, again, I, I'm not saying that necessarily because I'm in it. It's loaded. I, I buy it and read it. I love, uh, I love, I, I know a lot of those guys because you've had them at your seminars and stuff like that and uh, i've been fortunate to have a beer with a lot of those guys and uh yeah those guys are some of the smartest in the world in, in their in their field so uh, i'm excited to just read it yeah and i'm really stoked and happy and and really like appreciative that you're willing to allow us to put it out there and share it with everybody and you know like letting people see it and it's going to be on a bunch of different outlets because yeah. it is that good and it is something that needs to be shared. And hopefully it's something that gets people to talk and, you know, be more open to things. Cause I think that like, that's the other thing too, is that a lot of the stuff that gets talked about at times, you know, and that's why I brought up like squatting is people look at like what you're talking about in the, in the manual. And you're like, well, all he does is plyometrics, vision training, and these special exercises no. And that's not the case. No, I just assume everyone kind of knows the general. Um, you know, that's what Dr. Yesis does. I just assume everyone knows, you know, to do some kind of squat pattern, uh, whether it's two legs, single legs, something like that. So, you know what I mean? This is just something else uh, to possibly add to, to your toolbox. Yeah, no. And it's freaking killer stuff, bro. And really fortunate to have, somebody like you helping out so much with all this stuff and being like, was this your fourth time on the podcast? Yeah. Dude. Four episodes or four chapters, a freaking kick-ass presentation, um, a killer freaking coach's corner on the glued ham. Um, <laughs> I'm really fortunate to have you involved with everything we're doing here, Jeff. I can't thank you enough. Dude, I'll, I'll help you to the end, man, from one Rochester end to another, man. Yeah, man. Like, yeah, thanks so much, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I appreciate you being on tonight, brother, and we'll be in touch real soon. Go right. Bills. Go, go Bills. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch <laughs> soon, bud. All right, see you. Later. And a huge thanks to DC Sports Training's Jeff Moyer for spending the time with us today. Guys, awesome talk. Awesome stuff, as always, from Jeff. I truly do hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you did, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. We're just trying to get the best information possible out to all the great coaches out there. And as always, guys, thank you for everything you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.